First, let's introduce some characters, Alice, Bob, and Eve. Say Alice would like to send a secret message to Bob, but Eve is trying to listen in on the conversation. This process of securing messages is called encryption, which essentially encodes text into some other form which only the recipient, Bob, would be able to decipher. Let's define the basic process. Alice starts with her normal message called plain text, then passes that through some function encrypt. This output is what we call ciphertext and is sent to Bob. Bob then uses some function decrypt ciphertext, which converts it back into the original message. Many people should be able to use encryption at the same time. This means making the implementations of these functions public. Currently, everyone who uses them will encrypt and decrypt messages the same way. So you add some sort of key that's passing along with the plain and ciphertext. People who want to communicate with each other will share a key. The goal for Eve is trying to figure out the message from the ciphertext. Since they know the publicly available decrypt message, they just need a key. And thus, Alice and Bob's goal is to make it as hard as possible for Eve to find said key. As an example, the most basic quote-unquote encryption would be adding the key to the plain text for the encrypt method and subtracting the key from the ciphertext for the decrypt method. Even though they're called text, for almost all purposes they're converted into integer numbers. In order for Alice and Bob to use this system, they will have to agree upon a key beforehand, like 3. Now as an example, if Alice wants to send Bob her age, 20, Alice uses the encrypt function which gives an output of 23, and only this ciphertext 23 is given to Bob. Bob then uses the decrypt function which gives back an output of 20. This looks obviously insecure, but why exactly? Eve, as someone who only sees 23, will have no idea what Alice's actual age is. You can guess the key to be 2, 3, or 4, which would result in outputs 21, 20, and 19, respectively. These are all equally valid ages. The simple answer is that to even try to begin cracking the key, you will have to be able to somehow verify the output in some way. Maybe Eve was at Alice's 20th birthday when they received the message 23. Only then with knowledge of both the plain text and cipher text, in addition to the algorithm used for a bad encryption system, you can figure out the key 3. If we assume that Alice and Bob have been using the same key for multiple messages, and Eve has a record of their conversations without knowing what they mean, Eve can go back and decrypt every single message. Sometimes you don't even need the original message to guess the key. For our example, various numbers are possible to be the answer. In other cases, the plain text could be some sort of sentence in English that was converted into a number. There, you can just start trying different keys, and you will find many messages that look random while one of them is readable. Of course, this is just an assumption that they are speaking in English, and it's not impossible for them to pass an actually random looking message, and there isn't a mathematical way of being 100% certain. For other encryption methods that's even remotely decent, you'll have a hard time finding the key even if you knew both the plain text and the cipher text. We'll go over more robust algorithms in the next video, so be sure to subscribe. Now, returning to Alice and Bob. The fact that they both use the same key is what we call symmetric encryption. This method is secure and also fast with a good algorithm, but they have to somehow agree on the key in the first place. In the real world, this could be done by physically meeting in person and passing a paper note, or sending a message online through some other trusted and encrypted communications method. However, this makes it that your encryption method is only as secure as what you use to exchange the key, and if you don't have another method of communicating, that's a problem. So, introducing public-private key encryption, where you can send messages to anyone without prior contact. Instead of encrypt adding and decrypt, subtracting the same key, both of them use addition with two different keys. Now for each person, they generate their own set of two keys. For Alice, it would be 3 and negative 3. And for Bob, it's 5 and negative 5. They both choose one of the keys to give out publicly, in a way that everyone can see. This public key is called a public key. The private key is called the private key. If Alice wants to send a message to Bob, all she needs is Bob's public key because Bob has the other corresponding key to decrypt it. Alice sends a message 10 to Bob by adding the private key 5, resulting in 15 as a ciphertext. And Bob receives the number 15 and adds his private key negative 5 to get the original number 10. If Eve is listening and hears 15, they also have access to the public key 5. However, using that and adding it onto 15 gives 20, which isn't the decrypted message. With this system, it's straightforward to find the private key, simply negating the public key, but in reality, it would be practically impossible to find. 
One problem that public private key encryption poses is that anyone can send Bob a message. Before, Bob can be sure Alice is a sender because he only shares the key with her, but now there's no identification. However, a cool property is that instead of using the public key to encrypt and the private key to decrypt, you can also reverse it so that you use the private key to encrypt and the public key to decrypt. This time, Alice sends the message 10. However, instead of using Bob's public key, she encrypts the message using her own private key, negative 3. This results in 7 as a ciphertext. Now, anyone can use her public key 3 in the decrypt method to get back to number 10, meanwhile ensuring it was from Alice. Next video, we'll be looking at a widely used public private key encryption method called RSA.